think we're about to start. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Wolfgang Richter, I'm from Austria, I'm from Chipati, and I'm here to talk to you and with you and figure out whether doing the half the work in twice the time is something we could consider for our day-to-day -day work in future, probably. Um, we will shortly touch terminology, requirements, misconceptions, what is leadership all about in this context, consequences of decisions of doing half the work in twice the time in an agile context. So that means this is more like an interactive talk setup. We can't do really a workshop in here because you know because of the setup and etc. And the room is rather small. But what I want to do with you is an interactive talk, and we will do two experiments in within the next 19 minutes. 19 minutes. So doing half the work in twice the time. You know, I'm I'm a coach, I'm a trainer, I'm very often helping companies to go through adoptions, transformations from the traditional structures to agile structures. Very often when some management people, some C-level uh, people approach me, they start uh, asking, hey Wolfgang, can you help to increase productivity for us? Can you help to increase efficiency for us? Can we become more effective? And then my head starts spinning already, you know. What is productivity actually? What does productivity mean? What does efficiency mean? So this is about terminology now. I don't know what your experiences are. Probably we can right start with, uh, right away with a very short survey. Some examples. What is productivity in your context, in your understanding? Who has an example for me? I know it's very uh, early in the morning, it's the first session, so hats are not awake, but that was one of the reasons why I showed this video, so as a wake-up call. <laughs> um, I stuck here, sorry about that. What is productivity for you? Maybe more work hours uh, per worker. More work hours per worker. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Another definition. Uh, not wasting time with stuff you don't need. Not wasting time with stuff you don't need. <laughs> Not a wake up call. More outcome. Interesting. Any other definition? I wanted to have the catch box in here, so I'm the run on it. Only that. <laughs> Accomplishing what you set out to do in the morning, for example. Accomplishing what you planned. Okay. What you planned is an interesting keyword here. What in contrast to that is then efficiency? What do you think? If you, if you were asked, how can we become more efficient by your superior, by, by your boss, by your team members, in which way would you think? What would be more efficiency for you then, as a contrast? Not getting the right stuff done faster. The right stuff done faster. OK, interesting. Doing the job without wasting energy. Doing the job without wasting energy. Very interesting. Another one? You know, this track is called effectiveness over efficiency, so. Say, uh, doing less. Doing less, okay. So doing half the work, probably. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, and then in contrast to that, what is now eff effectiveness? We use this word so often, we are asked, obliged to become more effective so often. At least I was, and still am. What is effectiveness then? Doing things that matter. Doing things that matter, okay. You wanted to say the same thing? Yeah, no. uh, doing, uh, that what you're doing has an impact. Oh, yeah. ah, okay, <laughs> so it creates impact, it has an impact. Okay, let's see what Merriam-Webster's dictionary says about that. I like this very short definition of productivity, efficiency and effective very much. Productivity, the rate at which goods are produced or work is completed. Efficiency, the ability to do something or produce something without wasting materials, time or energy. We had that. And effectiveness, producing a result that is wanted. 
I really like these definitions because they take it to the, they bring it to the point. It's not complex, complicated, it's just very clear one sentence, ah, boom, that's it. So if we can talk to our superiors and say, hey, or they talk to us and say, hey, you have to be more productive, you have to be more efficient, then you can ask probably back, do you mean we should uh, increase the rate at which we produce something? Do you mean more that we are not wasting our time and energy anymore? Because I'm, I'm almost 100% sure, let's say 99%, that if you talk about efficiency, nobody thinks about not wasting time, material or energy. It means something completely different usually. It means going faster, rushing through something. Uh, uh, saving time could mean you reach the end faster, yes, but how then? And why? Okay. Does this make sense to you, these definitions? Okay? Mm. So then, let's hop into productivity a little bit more. Uh, in this course, I will touch also some psychological effects, team dynamic effects, etc. We will have one experiment uh, which relates to team dynamics a little bit and is also related to this uh, terminology, of course, to these words. Remember, the rate at which goods are produced or work is completed. Very important is the beginning, the rate, and completed. It's not only about sending off some, I mean, we are, we are here at uh, the Scrum Gathering, we are all somehow probably interested in agile principles, practices, philosophy, and there we have uh, working software, we have software completed, we have definitions of done as a tool, that means we have to focus on completing something. Not only doing the work, but completing it. Which is a very interesting and important differentiation to just doing something. So, but now, if there is this rate in there, this higher frequency probably, does this mean rate is related to speed? Is there a relation or a correlation? What do we think? Is the, can we interchange these terms? So, hey, we want to increase the rate. Does that mean we want to increase the speed? Yes, no, who says yes? Hands up. One, two, three, four. Who says no? More, <laughs> okay. Let's have a deeper look at that. I want to tell you a story I borrowed from Bas Wolle, who is the, one of the creators of large scale scrum. And he very often in keynotes tells the story about uh, going home with his son and being stuck in traffic, you know. And his, uh, his son was asking, asked him, hey dad, all the other cars on the other side, in the other direction, they're going very fast. Why are we going so slow? I want to go fast. And Buzz, his father then tells him, well, actually son, this is the way we need to go because we want to go home and this is our direction, right? <coughs> This is where we have to head to. So if I would ask you whether you want to go very fast in the wrong direction or very slow in the right direction, what would you choose? And his son responded, what do you think? Going very fast in the wrong direction, of course. <laughs> so, um, and this is, this is something when I heard this story the very first time at some gathering, I can't remember exactly. Um, it was, it, it was almost also a wake-up call. I'm very long in this business. I'm very long uh, I'm active as a coach and trainer, but um, I'm still wondering why so many of us and so many of us, our management people especially, want us to go very fast in the wrong direction. Maybe they are not aware of that, so it's not consciously ordered or uh, instructed, but very often in companies and organizations before we start this transformation, the analysis shows they are really going whatever wrong means in this context in a direction they are not, uh, which doesn't have impact in terms of creating more value for them. So going very fast in the wrong direction. Ah, I need to point here that it works. But how can we figure out whether we are going in the right or wrong direction, in which direction we actually should go? You know, in an actual context, especially if you work with Scrum, we have this product ownership and we have the role of the product owner. Um, to clarify a little bit more what product owner means in the original me uh, meaning when Ken Schwaber introduced this term. It's not another term for a business anal analyst. It's not another term for a requirements engineer. 
So this is very often a misconception, misunderstanding that the product owner is the person who writes, who writes user stories. Also user stories. When Ward Cunningham introduced this term user stories, he was not talking about who, what and uh, why. He was talking about exchanging this information and telling a story of how, what has to be done with the client, the customer, whoever wants that. This is the original intention. It was not about a template, it was not about writing them down, it was just about getting understanding for what needs to be done. This was the original intention. And the product owner usually, and in the original meaning, is a business person, like a product manager in a traditional term, which is uh, who can show the right direction. That means who understands the market, who understands the needs, and everything that influences it, right? So this is again about terminology. When I talk about a product owner, I'm talking, not talking about a business analyst. I'm talking really about this business person. And what does product ownership require? I mean, this is not a secret. This is not something you cannot read anywhere. You need a well-maintained product backlog. And I like to refer to a product backlog as a navigational system for product development teams, not a terminology. You know, in Scrum we have development teams, which doesn't translate, for example, I'm from Austria, I'm a native German speaker, development teams doesn't translate very well into German, it means programmers. But we are talking about product development teams, that means cross-functional, means everything that needs to be done, that you can produce, an outcome, that you can produce a product at which rate ever, but you can complete it. Productivity, we want to complete work, we want to complete products. And so if we know where we have to head to, which direction we need to go, so product owner, product backlog, then we also need something that really shows us the right direction. So the product owner needs some more input. I called it the right lubricant, you know, I started with this video with a ma a many cars in there going fast along the road and I will use this metaphor once again, uh, over and over again. You could also think about it as the secret sauce. What do you think is the secret sauce for a product ownership, for a product backlog, to be able to go in the right direction, to become the navigational system? What is the secret sauce? Stakeholder engagement. Stakeholder engagement is an input, of course. <coughs> Only one who's looking for one word. <laughs> Prioritization. Thank you. <laughs> um, prioritization, very often it's also referred to sorting, order, uh, ordering, whatever. But I like to use this term prioritization because it makes it really clear that there is something very important. So, the next challenge. What is a priority? How can the product owner or a stakeholder in, uh, delivering input for the product owner figure out what the highest priority is, what the next item to complete is? Isn't it simple? We need to figure out the highest business value. So, <laughs> I said it's an interactive talk. What is the highest business value in your environment, in your day-to-day -day work? Who is working in a larger company? Like, 100 people plus, uh, so I mean not only one person, two persons, but 100 people plus. <laughs> no. No. Okay. So what is the highest business value in your context? Um, or business value? Something which is considered to, uh, to, to give um, some, uh, something additional to the business, uh, ideally you, something that you can quantify. Okay, in, how? In, in total terms. In total terms. So you want to make profit um, as much as possible. Or be an enabler for that. Enabler for earning something. Yeah. Money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, thank you, any other uh, definition or idea about business value in a context, in a particular context? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, something that helps me achieve a kind of strategic goal of my company. Okay. What is the strategic goal of your company? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Just getting well, whatever I want to, to get more uh, customer or whatever. That's guessing now, right? That's guessing. <laughs> okay. So the navigational system is not on yet. <laughs> uh, 
For my company, it's um, time. So uh, business value in a particular story is how much time can it save for uh, its call center environment? How much time can it save for us to be able to speak to members uh, more quickly? Okay, this is more connected to the client side then, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the product you're, what, what are you producing? Um, it's, uh, we work in a, um, basically a healthcare sharing organization, and so it's uh, member engagement, and so they're calling in to ask questions about their medical needs, essentially. Okay. Uh, and so we want to be able to serve them and help them as quickly as possible, so the software needs to be in place to help the people talking on the phones to mm -hmm. assist the members sufficiently. Okay. That's an interesting explanation. One more, please. Thank you. So ours is uh, to reduce costs, anything that reduces operational costs and things that attract the client. Okay. So increase profit, reduce costs. Okay. Thank you. So this is at least some explanation of what a business value could mean, because business value is such an abstract term, and in every context it means something completely different. So usually the first question when I come to a, a, a company and I'll ask them, what is your strategy, what is your highest business value? And it's very often, I don't know, but not from anybody who is probably in the very low down in the food chain somewhere, uh, management people, very high up the chain, product managers. Recently I came across such a situation. What is the highest business value? You are the product manager, you are telling the others, you're the navigational system or the, you're uh, steering and maintaining the navigational system. How are you going to tell them in which direction they should go? I don't know. This was the answer. <laughs> but this was nothing, not a startup or so. So they were in place for about 20 years. And this is not uncommon. This is something I, I see very often, every second time at least, when I come to a new company. So, for me, my definition, business value is a selection of important attributes to figure out the optimal order of backlog items. And the attributes can mean, okay, we need to be able to reduce time, we need to be able to increase profit, we need to be able to attract more people, whatever it is. But that's not enough. This is another headline, a sub-headline, a subtitle probably, and then you need to figure out really what is helping to save time, for example. Is it that you can call somebody faster? Is it that you can make more calls probably at once? Whatever it means then. Or if we take the metaphor once again, it's if you think about navigational systems, it's the star satellites or other sources providing the right input for the navigational system like stakeholders, like market analysis, like probably analysis within the, in the uh, development department, whether the product is performing right or not, uh, in the right uh, sentence, in the right sense. But there is another misunderstanding I come across very, very often. Output versus outcome, you know? Output means producing something, completing something, but not knowing whether you really save time or increase profit or so. This is a different meaning. Output can mean quantity, more. We heard less could be better probably. So we could, could probably do less and still have more outcome. Wouldn't that be nice? I would love that. And that's actually what I'm very often aiming for. You know, this is also why I came up with this title, doing half the work and half the time. Less for more. So, another video. Maximizing output means going very fast. And going very fast means that you have to be aware of on which road you are, what the track is. Going very fast usually means being on a racetrack. But if you figure out that you're not on a racetrack, you're more like on a country road, then the problem is going very fast could have severe impact to your journey, right? I mean, there could be animals crossing the street, there could be pedestrians on the road, there could be uh, traffic in the other direction, all these kind of things, because it's not safe. On a racetrack, usually you are safe because you know there are no pedestrians. There's nobody crossing the street. There are no street lights or something like that, intersections. 
This is made for going fast. But very often in our business we are on country roads and still we have to go fast. And for that we need something which I divide into rules, guidelines and leeway. Rules means, okay, this is direction. Usually the traffic rules means you have to stay on your lane. But if you go very fast, like this guy is going up to 370 kilometers an hour currently, so 230 miles, that means you cannot stay on your lane anymore. That means you have to change your environment. You have to change the rules a little bit. You have, but you have still to provide guidelines. And you have to provide leeway that the driver can make his own decisions whether he wants to uh, pass the lane or stop or whatever. A guideline is, for example, stay on the road, stay on the track, because if you go off, then there will be an accident and you're lost. And also for, for the spectator, for the visitors outside of the track, there is no chance to interact with this guy anymore. You know, going 300, I, know, I don't know who, who drove a car with more than 300 kilometers an hour. We're in Germany, you know, you could do that. <laughs> I didn't yet. <coughs> I want to do it. <laughs> but um, if you're standing at the outside and if you go to a Formula One for race, for example, you cannot interact with these drivers. You cannot wave at them. They have no time to look at you and uh, watch whether you want to warn them for something or so. It's just impossible. That's the situation. So going very fast, producing more output probably, doesn't really mean to produce an outcome. There's a different correlation. Um, it that way. So, this means we need some kind of leadership, of course. And we already said the product owner. Product ownership means providing a navigational system for people. A navigational system means you know in which direction you can go. It doesn't mean you have to follow the rules exactly, because if you're driving and the uh, navigational system says stay on the highway, but you know it's jammed, then you probably will leave the highway. And they have to recalculate. That's exactly some metaphor for the interaction between development teams, product development teams, and the product <coughs> owner. You have to interact if the uh, situation changes, like traffic jam, jam across, or construction work on the road, or there was an accident. Then please recalculate, resort the items, find the right input, talk to each other. That's the product ownership <coughs> interaction. Product ownership is not only related to the product owner. Product ownership is a shared responsibility. But the product owner role is the role to make the decision then. Of course, together with the input and the influence from others. And management, they are there to provide the right environment. Like if you're on a country road, you have to close it for the rest of the traffic. You have to make sure there are no other cars on the road or pedestrians or animals or whatever, so that you really can go fast if you need to. So this is a management obligation. I mean, we heard yesterday in the keynote that obligation is something have to, don't want to, <laughs> if you were there. Sometimes it's that, the same for management. Sometimes they have to change something even if they don't want to. And then that includes, of course, then all the rules, guidelines and leave it, and they have to be clearly communicated. Otherwise, it's not going to work. If you're the driver and you don't understand the traffic rules or what's going on there or what you can allow yourself, you probably want to stay on your track, on your lane, which means you can't go as fast as possible. So that has to be communicated clearly. And for us as people, as I said in, uh, at the very beginning, that we also look a little bit about psychology, you know, what that means to us as people, as persons, as individuals. If you're going very fast, is there a race car driving in this room? Anyone? Car racing, probably? Yeah. Other races? <laughs> no. Um, it's stressful. It stresses us. If you're going very fast, you're very concentrated, and you know, your heartbeat goes up to 160, up to sometimes 200 beats per minute. And this is very much. This means stress to the body. And the same situation can occur in a working environment. If you're stressed all the time, this is then the body's reaction to harmful situations, and going very fast is a harmful situation very often. It's uh, the problem there is whether they are real or just perceived. So fictional, virtual, doesn't make any difference to the body's reaction, to our mind's reaction. It's the same situation for us as individuals. 
whether we just have the fear that something is wrong or stressing us, or whether it's really a harmful situation, we can't distinguish that. And our body reacts with chemical reactions, etc. Um, I picked out some emotional symptoms of stress, just to make it a little bit more clear. There are other physio physiological uh, symptoms, etc. But the emotions are tangible, they are clear, and if you see, you're becoming easily agitated. You're feeling overwhelmed very often. I mean, stress is one of the uh, root causes for burnout, of course. Uh, having difficulty relaxing, and we need to relax. Relax. We need to calm down. No race driver does not invest. This is not not <laughs> that all the race drivers invest time in relaxation because they need uh, recuperate. They need to build up the energy again. Okay, they lost during a race or the trainings. It leads very often to uh, low self-esteem and avoiding others. And if you read that and hear that. Do you think this has anything to do with being Agile? Not doing Agile, <laughs> whatever that means, I don't know. Being Agile, the philosophical part. In my opinion, no, absolutely no. Especially low self-esteem. <coughs> if you're not feeling safe anymore, if you're not feeling safe to speak up, if you're not safe, or feeling safe to interact with others, and avoiding others, of course, that's definitely nothing which is consistent to, for example, the Agile principles, like customer collaboration. Avoiding others means you're not cooperating with your customer anymore. It means you're not cooperating with your team members anymore. So this is definitely violating some of the main principles of Agility, which in conclusion means that if you're in a stressful, harmful situation for all the time, then you can't be Agile anymore. You can't head in the right direction. You can't use all the mechanisms <coughs> which were established for example in Scrum or Less or any other framework. And consequences of long-term stress, I mean, I don't want to go th uh, through them by detail, but you see, I had some stressful situations in my life already. <laughs> um, yeah, you can read them later <laughs> if you want to. But, uh, this is something we should also be aware of, especially if you're, we are leaders or managers, if we are in, uh, in charge of other people. We don't want to harm them and uh, stressful, long-term stress can lead to medical problems, which is the same as if I hit somebody in the face, it's just in a longer term. Uh, I copied that from a forum where uh, psychological problems are discussed and I liked it because this guy says, uh, it seems the world is moving so fast I can't keep up. He says he was an overachiever at some time. He says he was great in doing something. He, he was uh, in one of the best universities, etc. But now it's uh, the case that knowing I have tasks to complete throughout the day leaves me such dread that I can't enjoy any of it. Even if the, some of the tasks can ideally be enjoyable. That means if you're in this situation, if you have gone that far, at a very high speed probably. We can't come back easily to enjoying something, being agile. It's simply impossible. Our body, our mind doesn't allow it anymore. <coughs> and the, um, this sentence is also very interesting. I wish that the world would slow down by about half the speed it is functioning at right now. So his perception is that just the entire world is going too fast. Very often it's not the entire world, because if you look at different uh, regions in the world, um, I can remember a story actually when I went to Venezuela, it's a very long time ago, I think 15 years or so. When I returned to Austria to my work environment, I had really problems for the very first two or three weeks to keep up with the others, because there everything was going slower, it felt slower, it was more relaxed, you know. And when I came home, everybody was really at a high speed, rushing through tasks, getting things done. Not really done actually, but getting things done, it seemed. And I had to get used to that again. So it's not the entire world, of course, but in regions like Central Europe, very often we have this impression that the world is going too fast, at least I do. And this is going back to management and leadership. <laughs> Be aware that you have, if you have to go fast, if you have to produce much output, you have to have the right tools in place. Because if you, somebody asks you to go 370 kilometers an hour with this car, 
that could lead to such a situation, such a res uh, result. It's not a very good outcome, I guess. No. <laughs> um, we have this, um, very often in literature you find constant base. You want to have constant base. Like in a routine, you want to be routine, you have, want to have this flow, it should be a constant base. Which sounds very good, but if the constant space is 250 miles an hour every day, then it's exactly what we talked about before, stress. It's not sustainable, and that's actually the, the magic word here. It has to be sustainable base, right? Everybody agrees? I don't. <laughs> Um, why? Uh, of course, you know, we talked about burnout already, but there is another psychological symptom which is called bore out. And going very slow means it's sustainable pace, very easily sustainable pace, but it's just too slow. There's no challenge anymore. So, what, we, what else what we need that we really have the right amount of sustainable pace, the right speed actually, is we need to figure out what is the right amount of challenge we can face, we can stand. And then we have the right sustainable pace. So that's the reason why I don't agree to just saying we need sustainable pace. Going very slow can lead in the wrong direction. And it's easily sustainable. So, which leads us almost to our first experiment. I'll make a sidestep now to team dynamics a little bit, which is highly related to productivity and efficiency and introduce two effects. Uh, one is the Ringelmann effect, the other one is the Köhler effect. Who heard about Ringelmann before? No. Um, Ringelmann says the tendency for individual members of a group to become increasingly less productive as the size of the group increases. That means, here's uh, some, some calculation. If you have one person in place, and he did that with uh, rope pulling, you know, just as an experiment to <coughs> figure out whether they can really pull with the right uh, amount of power. And it was, I think it was Newton or something he measured. One person can pull with the strength of 100 units. Two persons mathematically sh and a team of two should be able to pull with 200 units. But in fact, it's only 186 anymore. Three persons, 256, and eight persons, 392. Which means, what is the other half of the team doing? Yeah. I mean, there is a reason for that. We have uh, in team dynamics uh, motivational and coordinational losses. And a coordinational loss is, for example, that not everybody pulls at the same time with the uh, same amount of power. And if you don't have really a well, a, a team, which is really a team, a high performing team as we call it very often, where they know when to pull and doing the same thing for the maximizing uh, uh, of outcome or output in that case, then you have this situation. <laughs> and that means that the bigger the teams are, the more this effect becomes valid usually. And uh, in literature there is a uh, as, uh, uh, taken from many studies, uh, for some studies actually, uh, the perfect amount of people in a team is, who knows that? 6, 4.3. 4.6 actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 0.6 is clear, I mean, this is not possible, but something around 4 and 5. <coughs> so more than that, the more you have in the team, the more the ring manifest <coughs> comes into place probably. And the other one, which is the positive version actually, is the Köhler effect, which is a phenomenon that occurs when a person works harder as a member of a group than when working alone. I don't like this word so much, harder, but it means that they are more engaged, they are more into the tasks, you know, they are <coughs> investing more of their energy for that. Hopefully the right amount of energy, but they become better than they would, could be if they would work alone. So this is the positive effect. And if you consider both the uh, two of them together, then probably you have the right team setup and you can really become more productive in your environment. Which leads us to an experiment then. And this is the risky part for me as a speaker because I need five volunteers. I'll explain.
explain briefly then what it means. But um, to make it more unattractive, you will I will film it. <laughs> I will, you will see it on the on the screen, and uh, you can also be criticized for what you did. <laughs> to make it more attractive, <coughs> it's about playing child's game. You know, if you still feel young enough, <laughs> then probably it's the right time to volunteer for that. Who is brave enough to take this challenge on? <coughs> I said this, sorry, Ski. One, okay, thank you. can you come to this place here? We have two, give them applause. Three, very good. Two more, please, or at least one. One, another one. Four is good enough, five would be perfect. Then do it with four. So, the rules are, everybody knows what are puzzles, what puzzle pieces are, how this works? So, you need to complete these puzzles here. Uh, you guys know what memory is, this game? Yeah, played it before? Put, put the cards over. Yeah, you have cards in here and you have to find bears, right? Okay, so I'll switch it briefly. This is another risky part because I want to show that on the camera. I hope that works, it worked earlier. So, can you see it? Yeah, perfect. So, we'll have these cards in place here, of course, and then need to be shuffled. And we have also the puzzle pieces in place turned over, and they have also to be pitted. shuffled, please. So that's the preparation. <coughs> so I didn't explain the exact rules before, so I need to switch back briefly. Um, you have the puzzle pieces, and you have a set of memory cards, and they have 40 members, don't worry about that. We will play three iterations. That means one iteration is that you have two minutes for planning, like figure out the best strategy to complete the work, and three minutes of doing. But I don't really care if you only invest 30 seconds or whatever for one or the other stuff. You have five minutes in total per iteration. You need to find all bears' memories, memory, and you have to complete both puzzles. But if you <coughs> Flip two cards and they don't match. You have to reshuffle it. <laughs> okay? Clear? And if I'm say reshuffle doesn't mean like, you know? <laughs> so it's really, reshuffling really means reshuffling the entire set. So we're trying to find only bears. Well, yes, the bears. We need to find the bears. If we find the bears, hey, there we go. So we find a bear. No pears. Bears. The, the matches, bears. The bears. matching the bears. items. Bear. So they are not bear. matching bears. <laughs> <laughs> not the bears, but the bears. <laughs> I have young Terminology. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's here now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you need five? Yeah. Hmm? Do you need five? Sure, if you want to, join them. <laughs> uh, and I would appreciate if somebody has a timer so that I don't need to do it. You have one? Great. You know, the iterations are two minutes of planning, three minutes of uh, doing. But you can say, uh, set up just five minutes and tell them two minutes are over and go to the next. Okay, good to go for the first iteration. <laughs> Like always in business, like right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, now two minutes. You have in total five minutes, but two minutes are considered to be planning. You can change this setup if you want to, but it's just five minutes in total per iteration. We have to solve both games. Sure. Okay. <laughs> and for the rest of the group, okay, uh, well, please observe what's going on there. You heard some of the psychological aspects, team dynamic aspects. Please observe them, observe them, listen what they're doing then, and then we have a short talk, a short review after that, a retro, a very short one, what happened there, whether they succeed or not. I agree. 
So it doesn't make any sense. Just just You have no chance of remembering anything, so you're playing this game. It's just chance. Don't now if you don't know anything about it's it. Five it's pure chance. In five minutes, then we can. Yeah. Okay. You guys okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay. 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 So I believe. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna go. Okay. Here we just start like. Maybe separating the puzzles at once and switching everything on the other side. Yeah. So we we allowed to switch everything on the other side. Yeah. We can first separate the puzzles and then switch it up over. Because there are two puzzles. It's not one. Did you start the red star? Okay. So maybe just check. Okay. So let's restart and then we see how the puzzle goes. I guess. Yeah. We start it once, get all together. Yeah. I believe that this game has very much to do with productivity and efficiency. You know?